All right, so this afternoon we have a very, very interesting panel here to mesmerize us with our, our knowledge. <laughs> I can see the Tom Chaker is laughing. <laughs> to mesmerize us with, not, with their knowledge, okay, <laughs> uh, about literature. So we have uh, a couple of our presenters uh, joining us from, from Kano. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kamal from uh, Bayro University, Kano, Dr. Maimoda from Aminu Kano College of Islamic and Legal Studies in Kano. So those are two from Kano from Nigeria. And uh, we have um, two presenters from right here in the US, East Tennessee State University, uh, Ms. Omolola and uh, Dr. Misheka, um, so that's from the US. Then we have um, Dr. Ngom from Senegal. Uh, I think, yeah, okay, yeah. She, I think she's still trying to connect uh, to us here. Uh, so, uh, so, so there is um, just a, a good range of topics here we're going to be uh, hearing this afternoon from our, our distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, Dr. Kamal will be speaking to us about uh, the modern house and novel, uh, reading the, uh, the modern house and novel. And uh, Dr. Maimota will be speaking to us about the rise of online house and novels. Um, I can't wait to, to I can't wait to, to listen to that. <laughs> the rise of online house and novels. And uh, we have from it, it East, uh, East Tennessee, uh, things fall apart from things fall apart to Kaitani Mutaraba, Ini, a look at diverse ways of expressing African languages, cultures, and literature. And uh, we have Dr. Ngom going to be speaking to us from I jam into Latin when writing system defines wall of literature. All right. So that's our lineup of uh, lineup of, uh, of presenters uh, this afternoon. And I still don't see Dr. Kamal here yet. So I think we'll just uh, start, we'll begin with, uh, with Dr. Maimota. All right, from Aminu, Aminu Kano College, Aminu College, Aminu Kano College of Islamic and Legal Studies. All right, we welcome you, Dr. Maimoda. Okay, and before we start though, uh, okay, it looks like, I don't think I can, I see Dr. Maimoda here either. Yes. Okay, I'm with you, sir. Oh, okay, okay, all right. So, so please, uh, because the presentations are 20 minutes, so to have time for q and A, I I know that's a very, very hard thing to ask professors to do, you know, to speak for just 15 minutes. That's almost like, uh, you know, just giving an introduction <laughs> to something. But please, let's try very hard, you know, if we can just uh, do 15 minute presentation, that way we'll have the time for questions and answers. Okay, should I start? Sir? Yes, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Aisha Shumi Mota from Amin Kano College of Islamic and Legal Studies, Kano, Nigeria. The title of my paper is Literature at Your Fingertips The Rise of Online House Novels. Okay, let's start with a brief about Hausa. 
Hausa is the uh, Hausa is a language. It's a language of people living in an area called Hausa land, which is located in West African region. That is like uh, we have Nigeria, we have Niger, we have Cameroon and Chad. So let's move on. Hausa liter literature. Hausa literature, according to Yahaya 1988, Hausa literature was begun when Hausa people accepted Islam and learned how to read and write in Arabic. Later, they developed Ajami. That is, Ajami is, an, is a form of Hausa writing by using Arabic letters. Um, about uh, Hausa novels. Hausa novels, according to Adami 2017, Hausa fictions or short stories were introduced by British colonialists who provide it as a, to serve as a learning material for Hausa Boko uh, learners. Then um, Yahaya 1988 um, stated that the competition of 1990-1933 that is organized by the Hausa literature Beru serve as the first Hausa novel uh, writing uh, that in classic Hausa. Then when we move to the turning point, according to Adamu 1980 is the turning point of Hausa prose fiction literature. Then fun is 2000. Added that uh, in internet write popular writings, and they are equally being the readers of such literature. Mukhtar, 2004, has documented over 50 women writers and their works in his book. So we can therefore conclude that Hausa novels always goes with time and global changes. So also there are uh, classic, and from 90s, we can understand that women write more than men in such popular novels in Hausa. What this paper is all about is the paper studies the rise of Hausa novels, that is its writers, the, uh, the authors, as well as the, its impact, the both positive and negative impacts. And the research tries to answer the following questions. That is, when did online Hausa novels started? Who are its authors? Then what are the, the channels of disseminating or transmitting online Hausa novels? Then what are the positive and negative if, impacts of online Hausa novels to the society? The methodology of conducting this research was conducted through interview with Hausa novel authors, both published novel, writers and online uh, writers, the governmental officials who are responsible for censoring such uh, all types of literature, then the marketers of, uh, of published novels. Then from my interview, I interview about 50 people. Then being the research is concerned with internet, so internet novels, uh, web pages like WhatsApp, Facebook, Wattpad, WordPress has been visited so as to conduct the research. About Hausa novels, it can be defined as the genre of Hausa fictional stories that are published on web pages. That is Memota 2021. About the origin of online Hausa novel, this research realized that online Hausa novels come into existence in 2013 with a book called Kechi Gudelia, uh, published by one writer called Benazir Umar. Kechi Gudelia means you are the only one. It served as the first online Hausa novel in 2013. And from that time, there are more than 10,000 online Hausa novels from different authors. Online Hausa novel authors. Online Hausa novel authors are authors with no prior writing experience because most of them started writing online as they have stated that they have never published a book concerning novel. They only started their writing online. And over 70% of such authors were women. 
by the uh, at the age of 23 to 40 years. So among the authors are uh, Belnazir Umar, as I mentioned earlier, the author of Ketchu Gudelia, and Dengi Miji in 2014. Others are uh, Batul Maman, the author of Farar Haihua and Gumin Halak. Then Hasana Suleiman was among the authors, author of Yanar Gizu Aram and Rayuan Najwa, all are Hausa online novels. So what are the channels of reading online Hausa novels? Online Hausa novels can be read from the uh, reader's smartphones connected with internet through the author's page like WhatsApp, Wattpad, WordPress, Facebook, and others. So the negative impact of online Hausa novels. The rise of online Hausa novels has contributed to the spread of Hausa literature globally. So also the rise of Hausa novels shows that the Hausa people were not left behind in any situation they found themselves. That is, they go with the current global technology. Then online Hausa novels all try to portray the Hausa culture, also the socioeconomic and religious problems of the society. For example, uh, there was a novel called Hangendala of Sapia Huguma, which shows the problems of Hausa polygamous setups. Then Gumin Halak of Batul Maman highlight the implications of rape to both the victim and her family. Others are Takari, which dwell on women and children, immigrants in Saudi Arabia, called Takari, and the hardship and danger they are exposed to as a result of high expectation of the wealth they will gain there. Then finally, Kudubemu by Batil Maman is portraying the social life of the military officers and their family. So then another impact, uh, positive impact of Hausa novel is that Hausa novel can be source of data for research. That is, it is researchable. The negative impacts, though it has the positive impact, its negative impacts are not limited, but these three, they are, there are a lot of orthographical errors in those online house novels. Then they lack censoring from qualified agencies. Also, the authors sometimes use vulgar languages, that is dirty language, which is prohibited among the house society. The findings. The paper realized, realizes that the introduction of online Hausa novels has impacted the production and sales of Hausa published novels. Also, the research discovered that online Hausa novels has been accepted by both governmental and non-governmental organizations, as well as international organizations like BBC Hausa, as they annually organize uh, a, a, a program called Hikayata, whereby the Hausa authors emerge as the winner in 2019 and 2020, respectively. Then the research also discovered that online Hausa novel can be researchable, as I have mentioned earlier. The paper also realizes Hausa novels lack editing from qualified agencies like NNPC, which serve as the body to edit such uh, Hausa novels, but online Hausa novel lacks such agencies. The research also discovered since the early 90s, women serve as the writers of uh, rights more than their male counterpart as a result of the formal free education they were given by the universal primary education of the country, later the UBE. Then conclusion. This research investigates the rise and impacts of household online novels one can therefore conclude that the literature is at one fingertips or the gaze has turned to the sky as the global digital drive is impacting on Hausa Nobel. That's the reference. Thank you for Thank listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very good. But well, what I will do is I will ask us to hold our questions uh, until everybody uh, must have uh, presented. So that way okay, we'll sir. just do all the questions the Q&A uh, at the end. Okay. All right, thank you very much uh, to, to Dr. Kamal. Uh, no. 
Oh, sorry, okay. sorry. Doctor. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. I, I said, okay. um, all right, so let's let's move on to is Doctor Okay. Is Doctor Kamala here now? Is Doctor Ali Kamal here? Okay. So we let's have uh next uh Miss Omalola and uh Dr. Micheka. So I don't know how both of you who is going first, but I know you're making one this one presentation, both of you. Could could you please remove the PowerPoint? Dr. Mamota, yeah. Hello? Dr. Mamota? Aisha? Dr. Mamota? The co-host can do it as well. The, the, ho the person hosting the meeting can stop the screen okay. sharing. Okay, I think she is. Oh. Okay, try it. Try it now. I think she is. Uh, she is right. Uh, moved it. It's a Malala. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Well, I, I guess we get to go now, right? Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for giving us this opportunity to meet virtually. Would have loved to meet face to face, but this is this is a really great option. Um, my name is Martha Micheka from East Tennessee State University, and um, the main presenter for the session is actually Miss um, uh, Lola Giwa. And I wanted to take just a few minutes and introduce our presentation this afternoon. Um, our topic, Things Fall Apart to Saitani Mutarabaini. I don't speak that language, so um, let me not fool you that that is how it's pronounced. That is um, Gikuyu, Ngugi Wationgo's um, ethnic language. A look at the diverse ways of expressing African languages, cultures, and literature. Although we all understand what literature is, I mean, being here in this uh, session, the definition is not always unanimously agreed. What we know, however, is that our literature tells our story, a story of who we are and where we've come from. While their literature, whoever that other person is, their literature will share with us the experience of those people and invite us to experience it even partially with them. So if you've read a text from a different culture, you, you are welcomed into that culture through that reading. Um, according to Christopher Codwell, literature's task is keeping the collective imagination of a society alive such that its members were able to channel their energies to communal social construction. So through literature, we are able to think together, to imagine together, to, to work together as a community. Just like a given language unifies us, right now English is what is unifying us in this conference, literature too does unify us and many times we talk about some texts we've read together we talk about um, our experience reading things fall apart together for instance or um, some of us will be talking about a kenyan text the river and the source that we've read together that brings us together just like language does and um so the the way language is tied to literature then is, is a, a question of concern here. What language will best represent our Africanness? When we share language, when we share literature, um, when we read something in literature, 
sometimes we've read something and cried or laughed because that particular literature touches a chord in our lives. It touches an experience we share with the characters in the text. Um, and we identify with the characters. We get angry with certain characters or happy with given characters in the texts we read because that is what literature does. Um, Jeanette Gildorf states that literature encodes cultural activity and all the time, whenever we are reading, we experience that cultural activity through that reading. So um, in, in talking about literature, then language is, is key. We argue about what language will best express the values of a given society. Um, so our key questions in this afternoon that uh, Ms. Um, Omolola is going to present on our, what exactly is African literature and what role do the various languages used play in determining what is African and what is not? Um, what language best communicates our cultures and our Africanness? We've taken two texts and two key authors in our African literature to um, raise our discussion this afternoon. We, um, Achebe argues that you cannot cram African literature into a small, neat definition. And he says, quote, I do not see African literature as one unit, but as a group of associated units. In fact, the sum total of all the national and ethnic literatures of Africa. So Achebe further talks about what he considers to be national literature. In his view, a national literature is one that is available to other ethnic groups. Ngugi, on the other hand, argues that African literature can only be written in African languages. These two great and pioneer African authors leave us with challenging questions, more like two camps, which one do we belong to? Does Achebe's work, which is written in English, things fall apart? and many of other works still count as African literature then, if we argue that um, African literature can only be written in African languages? Or how about Ngugi's Saitani Mutarabaini, the devil on the cross? Is that African literature, considering that it's written in an ethnic language in Kikuyu? Um, so using these two texts, uh, Things Fall Apart and The Devil on the Cross, we, um, we analyze language use and we argue that these are two different ways of expressing African philosophical realities and the African oral tradition. Achebe relying on his English, say that his English, and Ngugi relying on his ethnic language with a translation. So welcome, Omolola. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be beginning with African literature. So um, African literature had been predominantly oral up to the 19th century when attempts to put some African languages into written forms began. According to Sarah Mazagora, Many scholars linked European language traditions to the global, the written, and the modern, while African language traditions were often qualified in relation to the local, the oral, and the past. However, Dasson O.R. says that literature in the vernacular languages of Africa provides an imaginative and essential link with unwritten indigenous literature. This means that written literature helps the oral tradition of Africa express its versatility and diversity. There have been several debates on the language of African literature and whether it should be written in African languages or in European languages. Scholars such as Ngugi Mwafiongo in his text, Decolonizing his the Mind, says that African literature can only be written in African languages. According to um, Adeji Mobi Moradeon, Ngugi's opinion rests on the fact that literature is generally identified by language, and Mazisi Kunene affirms that European languages are totally inadequate to express the African philosophical reality. All this means that African literature written in African languages expresses and reflects the African philosophical reality and the African oral tradition better than those written in European languages. However, writers such as Chinua Chibe contend with these views. 
according to Paka Roberts, Achebe writes not in British English, but in African English, code switching and mixing English with his indigenous language in order to reach a larger audience of Africans. Achebe's essay, the African writer and the English language in every respect is through African literature and foreign languages. In this essay, Achebe gives a definition of African literature. He says, you cannot cram African literature into a small unit definition. I do not see African literature as one unit, but as a group of associated units. In fact, the sum total of all the national and ethnic literatures of Africa. Achebe later indicates in this essay that the national language of many African countries is English. Achebe also says in this essay that there was certainly a great advantage to writing in the world language. Achebe believes that the African writer can learn English well enough to be able to use it effectively in creative writing. However, he hopes that the African writer will not learn to use English like a native, like a native speaker. The African writer should use the English language in such a way that is able to convey his message best without risking that the language loses its value as a medium of international exchange. He also feels that the English language will be able to express his African experience because it will be a new version of English that expresses his African origin. He writes that, he writes, but I feel that the English language will be able to carry the weight of my African experience, but it will have to be a new English, still in full communion with his essential home, but altered to suit its new African surroundings. This points out that um, Achebe doesn't write in the same language as the language of the colonizers. Achebe writes not in British English, but in African English, because he has made British English to suit his African origin and surroundings. While Ngugi Mwathiongo's writing in native languages and creating a national literature is crucial to the project of, free, of real freedom and independence from the colonial heritage and influences, and this is the main subject of his book, Decolonizing the Mind. In this novel, Theongo discusses the importance of oral literature to his childhood. He says you can't study African literatures without studying the particular cultures and oral traditions from which Africans draw their plots, styles, and metaphors. Theongo says there's a blindness to the indigenous voice of Africans, and this blindness is a, is a direct result of colonization. He explains that during colonization, Missionaries and colonial administrators controlled publishing houses and the educational context of novels. Ungugi argues that colonization was not simply a process of physical force, but rather the bullet was the means of physical subjugation while language was the means of the spiritual subjugation. Ungugi argues that writing in African languages is a necessary step toward cultural identity and independence from centuries of European exploitation. Ungugu sees using African languages in African literature as a tool to take back Africa from the colonizers. And because of the close relationship between language and culture, he says African languages best expresses our African culture. So I'm going to talk about a brief analysis of Achebe's Things Fall Apart. Things Fall Apart is generally seen as Achebe's way of taking Africa back from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. The missionaries and colonial masters invaded Okonkwo with a new religion and language. Like Robert Parker said in his How to Interpret Literature, postcolonial literature responds to changes in the world, such as politics and the growing recognition of English as a language of international literature. Chinua Achebe, through the character of Okonkwo, gives detailed accounts of the clash between the two cultures, that is, the colonizer and the colonized. After the arrival of the Christian culture, the first coalition that takes place is at the individual level and then at the societal level. Although the Igbo people have their customs and traditions, the Europeans do not understand, which is why they showed no respect for the cultural practices of the Igbo people. Achebe presents the complexities and depths of an African culture to readers of other cultures, as well as to readers of his own culture by using English. By using one of the universal languages, it reaches many more readers and has a much greater literary impact than if he would have written it in a language such as Igbo. Writers who write in their native language must eventually allow their works to be translated, often into English, so readers outside the culture can learn about it. Achebe's use of the English language can create a problem for him. How can he present the African heritage and culture in a language that can never describe it adequately? 
Indeed, one of the primary tasks of things for La Pat is to confront this lack of understanding between the Igbo culture and the colonialist culture. In the novel, the Igbo asks how the white man can call Igbo customs bad when he does not even speak the Igbo language. An understanding of Igbo culture can only be possible when the outsider can relate to the Igbo language and terminology. By incorporating Igbo words, rhythms, language, and concepts into an English text about this culture, Achebe goes a long way to bridge a cultural divide. Achebe incorporates Igbo vocabulary and terms such as chi, egugu, obanji, and obi, and he uses this in a context that would allow the readers to understand what it means. Chi, for example, represents a significant complex Igbo concept that Achebe repeatedly refers to by illustrating the concept in various contexts throughout the story. Achebe translates Chi as personal God when he first mentions Unuka's bad fortune. Open quote, Unuka was an ill-fated man. He had a bad Chi or personal God and evil fortune followed him to the grave, end of quote. The understanding of Chi and its significance in evil culture grows as one progresses throughout the book. Another example of Achebe's incorporation of Igbo elements in his frequent reference to traditional is his frequent reference to traditional Igbo proverbs and terms. These particular elements give things for Lapant an authentic African voice. The Igbo culture is fundamentally an oral one, and Achebe says in this novel, among the Igbo, the act of conversation is regarded very highly, and proverbs are the palm oil with which words are eaten. To provide an authentic feel for the Igbo culture would be impossible without also allowing the proverbs to play a significant role in the novel. Despite the Igbo origin of these proverbs and tales, a non-Igbo speaker can relate very well to many of them. They are woven smoothly into their context and require only occasional explanation or elaboration. These proverbs and tales can be said to be quite similar in relation to Western sayings and fables. Achebe incorporates not only Igbo, but also another variant of Nigerian language called Nigerian Pidgin English. According to Todd, Pidgin is a simplified form of languages for communicating between groups of people who normally speak different languages. And Achebe uses only a few Pidgin words or phrases in things fall apart, such as Tai Tai, which means to tie, Kotma, which is a crude form of cut messenger, and Yesa. Just enough to suggest that a form of Pidgin English was being established. As colonialists, the British were adept at installing the Pidgin English in their new colonies. Unfortunately, Pidgin sometimes takes on characteristics of master to servant communication. It can sound patronizing on the one hand and subservient on the other. Furthermore, using the simplified language can become an easy excuse for not learning the standard languages for which it substitutes. Achebe code mixes Pidgin English with English to bridge the gap between the educated that speak English fluently and the uneducated that are not so fluent with English. Achebe's use of Igbo language, proverbs, and richly drawn characters create an authentic African story that effectively bridges the cultural and historical gap between the reader and the Igbo culture. Things for like past can be considered an African literature for many reasons, but particularly because Achebe's use of the Igbo language and Pidgin English in a novel that is written in English extends the boundaries of what is considered English fiction and can be considered Nigerian or African literature because it expresses the language, the culture, and characteristics of the people. So I'm going to be talking about um, Ungugi's Kaitani Mutharabaini. Well, uh, also, just about a couple more minutes. Okay, I'll just rush through it. Um, Devil on the Cross is the 1980 Yukuyu novel with the original title Kaitani Mutarabaini, which was written and later translated by Ngugi himself into English. In this novel, Ngugi sought to interrogate what had brought both he and his country to the point of capitalism and new colonials, where foreign culture and ideas were embraced while local culture and truth tellers were relegated to both literal and figurative prisons. Key to this interrogation for Ungungi was his choice to write the novel in Gikuyu, his native language and a local Kenyan dialect. Ungungi chose to write the novel in Gikuyu because of his views on language, which he sees as not just a means of communication with one another, but also a reflection of our cultures and the material reality shaped by these cultures. To tell the truth of what was happening in Kenya, Ungungi felt that it was necessary to show this truth as depicted 
using a Kenyan language rather than the language of the colonizers who had brought misery on Kenya in the first place. Um, the main reason why, um, another reason why Nguge uses um, is native language is to be able to reach the peasants and the poor people who cannot speak English, which are the main people who he tries to reinforce into his revolutionary act. One of the most important aspects of the oral tradition that Nguge employs in Devil on the Cross so as to glue the attention of his audience is the use of storytelling. And an example of storytelling in the text is certain people in Umarag, our Dumara, told me that this story was too disgraceful, too shameful, that it should be concealed in the depths of everlasting darkness. There were others who claimed that it should be suppressed so that we should not shed a tear the second time. I asked them, how can we cover up pits in our courtyard with leaves or grass, saying to ourselves that because our eyes cannot see the holes, our children can prance about the yard as they like. This example has a conversational style, which is a characteristic of most of Devil on the Cross, a story which is essentially cast in the mood of an oral tale. Also, another effective oral quality that Nyongo employs in this novel is the variant use of a Kikandi player to narrate the story. And according to C. Cagnolo, in Gikuyu society, a Gikandi player is a professional raconteur who goes around the country like a medieval storyteller, stopping at markets and squares to sing his poem to the accompaniment of his bottle guard. Adopting this narrative technique appears designed to ensure that the attention of his audience is throughout held and sustained. One of the major reasons why Ngugi is determined to capture the attention of his audience is so as to drive home his message that the Kenyan middle class elite engage in exploitation on a wild scale. In conclusion, both of these texts by Achebe and Ngugi shows that African literature can be written in both English and African languages, as long as the use of English expresses the African culture and values like the African oral tra traditions, just like Achebe's English does in Things Fall Apart. Also, the use of African languages in literature is very important, like Ngugi Masiogo, who sees it as a necessary step toward cultural identity and independence from centuries of European exploitation. Using African languages in our literature, either explicitly like Ungugi or could mixing it with the European language like Achebe, helps reflect the African tradition and values, hence making both authors right. Sorry about my time. Thank you, no problem. Thank you very much. All right. That was very good. Okay, let's uh, move. I think Dr. Ugom from Senegal. I think you are next. Dr. Ngong. Dr. Usman Ngong. I do see him here, but it seems yeah. that he's not. Uh... He's muted too. Oh, oh, yes, I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much um, for giving me the floor. And I would like to say my thank to uh, Dr. Samba Kamara and to uh, Dr. Mamzandi for having invited me to this uh, session. Also, my thank to uh, Stacy, all those people I knew during my uh, Fulbright stay in uh, UNC in 2018. So it is a pleasure to see them again today. Okay, my name is uh, Usman Gong, for those who don't know me yet. And uh, I teach African and uh, comparative literature at Gaston Berger University. And uh, today I would like to share with you uh, some of my research on the uh, uh, world of literature. Uh, uh, I would like to... Uh, share my screen, uh, just give me a minute. Um, yes, okay, I think, no. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Okay, 
I think it's okay now. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, 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 from a journey to relating uh, wall of literature when the writing uh, characters uh, uh, define uh, the theme of a uh, wall of uh, literature. Um, as you know, in Senegal, we have a rich tradition of oral literature uh, in the world of language, uh, which is uh, produced in two different systems of writing. Uh, the first system is called Ajami, which is a heritage of the Islamization. And it consists of a scholarly use of uh, uh, the Arabic uh, alphabet in transcribing other languages, including uh, Wolof. And the second system draws uh, from the uh, Latin characters, uh, which is a colonial heritage of the French school. And the two systems translate two civilizations, two different modes of thought, knowledge, and skills that are observable in the literary genres, in the forms and the themes produced by the authors uh, based on, the respective, on their respective uh, training. But regardless of the uh, differences, uh, uh, both writing systems draw from the wall of oral tradition and they constitute uh, forms of promoting wall of language and literature. And uh, I think that the use of Western alphabet had significant impact on the wall of uh, literature and uh, that uh, I will identify some aspects of the divergences born in the foreign influences of world of literature, and then describe aspects of the originality of world of literature that transcend systems of writing. And uh, maybe lastly, I will show that literature has flourished as a result of the literary uh, trade between the Jeremy and the Latin system. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, first of all, we should uh, say a few words uh, about Ajami, because Ajami is uh, the using the use of the Arab Arabic characters to write foreign languages, and with Islamization and the trade with the Arab and the Berber world. Africans developed a writing system that borrowed its alphabet from Arabic characters and added diacritical marks to represent African sounds that do not exist in Arabic. And this script is known as Ajami, a term used in Arabic to refer to non-Arabic speakers, but also to refer to uh, uh, everything that is written using Arabic uh, alphabet, but which is not uh, Arabic. So uh, this is the uh, definition of uh, Arabic. And in Senegal, Ajami has, is better known as uh, Wolofal, Wolofal because, uh, not because uh, Wolof is the only ethnic group uh, to use the uh, Arabic alphabet uh, for their writing, because there are many other groups like the Pula, the, uh, the Soninke, etc. But it's simply because Wolof is the uh, dominant lingua franca. And the people, uh, they tend to associate uh, Wolof with everything that is local or everything that is a traditional uh, as opposed to what is uh, foreign. Uh, for instance, you can hear people saying, where Wolof? Uh, in order to uh, refer to the lunar moon, uh, the, the month, uh, the lunar month, or Pajim Wolof, in order to talk about uh, 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 traditional medicine, or Yere Wolof, just to uh, talk about uh, uh, clothing that uh, is uh, from uh, Senegal, for instance. Okay. And uh, when Wolof was first uh, used as a way of uh, writing, uh, when Arabic, I, I'm sorry, was uh, first used as a way of writing, uh, some people say it was around the 19th century, okay? 
uh, and it was just for religious purposes. People wanted to uh, record, uh, meaning the Islamic precept and the Islamic teaching. And uh, since uh, all of them did not uh, speak Arabic, they used the uh, Arabic letters in order to write directly in uh, their, uh, their language. And uh, in the case of Wolof, that was called Wolofal. And uh, you had a religious purpose, means of communication, but also to document some political agreements between the kingdoms, also between uh, some authorities. Uh, and uh, uh, you can also uh, uh, use Wolofal uh, to keep commercial records, but also some medical procedures in order to uh, share them maybe later with uh, other people. Now, the literary use of Wolof, of uh, uh, Wolof came later. Okay? Uh, although Wolof, uh, the, first, uh, the first practice of Ajami can be retraced to the 18th and 19th century, evidence of its use in literature is more recent. And the first literary texts found are monogeric poems dedicated to the prophet of Islam, uh, and to the founding saints of the brotherhood. And uh, in this field, the best known poets are uh, 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 Samba Jarambay, you have uh, Serin Mor Kaire, you have uh, uh, Sheikh Musa Ka. And Sheikh Musa Ka is one of the most prominent or the most famous, okay? Uh, because of his masterpiece called Harnubi. Harnubi is a, a poem in which uh, uh, Shah Musaka uh, writes about the difficulties that uh, uh, hit Senegal, but also uh, all the world in 1929 during the, the crisis, but also uh, in the drought of the 1930s. The, so Sir Musaka uh, is considered as the standard bearer of this uh, religious literature in Wolof language because of his prolixity and because of the popularity of his poem, uh, which continue until now to inspire modern Senegalese literature and music. Uh, his works are more than religious liturgies. They are chronicles, historical, philosophical, and moralizing literary documents. In his most popular, a poem called Harnubi or the Century uh, is a long complaint that records the throes of the economic crisis of the 1929 uh, combined with the truth of the 1930s. And in this poem, he calls upon Sir Ahmadou Bamba, uh, his religious guide, to intercede in the favor of the community and uh, uh, to plead uh, for Allah got to have mercy on the community and to give them back the favor. Okay? And many of the literary texts of the writers are, uh, you know, uh, praising the prophet of Islam, but also, uh, you know, uh, praising the biography of their religious guide. For instance, for the Muslim, uh, for the uh, Murid Brotherhood, there are many writers who write chronicles of uh, Shah Ahmadu Bamba's uh, life, but also in other uh, tariha or brotherhood like uh, the Tijaniya and also the Lion, there are people retracing the uh, the biography, the biography of the of the religious guide. But something that's very interesting with uh, Shah Musaka is that he theorized the use of Wolof. He did not only write in Wolof, but also he advocated that Wolof was a language worth writing in it. Uh, in this short uh, uh, quotation, he said that Tereb Wolof ak bop yaram ak wakhye payam lujok ngir rasulullahi batin basaf horom. And the translation is Wolof literature has nothing to envy Arabic or any other language. 
all that is intended to the to the messenger of Allah has a delicious taste. Okay, and in another statement, uh, he said that any language is beautiful that broadens the intellectual horizon of the human being and gives the enslaved man a taste for freedom. So for Sheikh Musaka, it was not only uh, the writing in Wolof, but also uh, the uh, advocacy of uh, the use of Wolof as a writing uh, for, for literature. Because for him, he was really aware that the target was really a uh, Wolofon and that the target, they did not all uh, speak Arab or any other languages, but simply Wolof. Uh, now, uh, you have the uh, uh, Arab or the Ajami literature, and you see that it is fully influenced by religion, by Islam. But later on, you have people using the Latin alphabet uh, to write Wolof literature. And those people, they are most of the time a uh, product of the uh, uh, colonization school, meaning the French school. And uh, with these forms of writing, they uh, try to explore new themes and new genres. For instance, in the uh, Ajami, the only genre was poem. But now with this uh, Latin alphabet uh, based literature, people are writing some kind of plays uh uh pieces but also uh, short stories and novels and uh, if anything one could say that the latin alphabet or the recourse to the latin the latin alphabet has democratized the uh, senegalese wall of literature because thanks to it you see some uh, women writers okay? Uh, for instance, uh, Mam Yunus Jang was even the first one to publish a novel in Wolof. And she's a woman. She was a school teacher and uh, she uh, translated the national anthem while he, she was a school teacher. But later on, uh, she uh, started writing in Wolof. And the first book ever published, the first novel was thanks to Mam Yunus Jain. And that, the name of that novel is Aobi, and it is called The First Wife. And uh, it uh, shows the concerns of women in a, a polygamous uh, uh, marriage and uh, showing the difficulties they can uh, find in there. But also Dabanyan is another one. And uh, uh, she also, wrote a wonderful novel, really beautiful in forms of uh, the structure, because it is well more uh, elaborated than the Mam Yunus Chang's R.O.B. This novel is structured into nine uh, nights, and uh, the character will dream his life, meaning uh, she will uh, recall her life back from the first night to the uh, last night, and it is nine, nine, uh, ninth. And uh, uh, this novel also just shows the difficulties that are faced by women in their uh, in their in their household uh, when the, their husband or when their family in laws are really difficult to live with. Okay, so, uh, women. I have only mentioned these two, but there are many, many other uh, female writers, but uh, we have uh, some male writers. And uh, why I have introduced here the, uh, these two names, Sheikh Ali Undaw and Bubakar Purishyo, because to me, they are the most important writers in world of literature. Because Sheikh Ali Undaw, he wrote many novels before uh, writing in world of uh, it is the case of Bubakar Boris Diop also, uh, one of the uh, most uh, uh, celebrated African uh, writers to date, but he decided 
to write now in uh, in Wolof. Okay? And in their writings, they explore new themes uh, as uh, modernity and the difficulties one can find related to corruption, related to some political uh, difficulties, um, some uh, political situations, and uh, but also they uh, give, uh, let's say, a momentum to the writing in all of. Uh, uh, in the world of language because they too advocate that although they have written many novels before writing in Wolof, what they wrote in Wolof is really different from what they previously uh, wrote in using French, meaning in Wolof they th say that they can express themselves uh, uh, more eloquently uh, without using the dictionary, because they say that when you are writing in uh, French, you are using the dictionary, because this is not the language that you are uh, using every day. It's not an everyday language, uh, contrary to to Wolof. Mm -hmm. And so the two different literature, they are uh, different. In terms of genre, the first one is only uh, poetry, as I said, but based on religion. But the second one is the literature that uses uh, Latin uh, characters. This uh, is simply uh, a kind of translation of uh, uh, European literature, meaning you see the same genres, you can see also the same themes. But the problem is that people who use only uh, the Ajami cannot read what is written in uh, Wolof with the Latin characters and vice versa. But now people are doing a kind of transliteration, meaning they're using what uh, is written by uh, uh, with the Arabic Ajami and transliterate that into the Latin Arabic, so that into the, the Latin uh, alphabet, I mean, so that people who are not very conversant with Arabic can, can read, you see. And there is an important project, this is a software called Latin to Ajami, that some people, some colleagues in my university are working on, uh, and they are uh, some linguists, uh, some uh, professors in mathematics department and also others in the computer science department. And uh, the aim of this is simply to uh, uh, create a kind of software in which you put directly a text in Ajami and you have it directly in, in, in Latin, okay? So this is uh, very important because it kind of uh, uh, dislocate uh, the, those two literature and make them available for, for everybody. Now, although the two literatures are a bit different, they have many common grounds and uh, they use the uh, oral tradition and uh, they use uh, references to storytelling and to proverbs and sayings meaning in all those literatures, you can see that they have many uh, things in common. And this is the oral uh, uh, literature or the oral tradition. Uh, as a closing remark, I would say that all of literature is very rich. Okay? Although it is written in uh, two different modes of writing, but now people are more and more engaged in that literature all the more since they can now, uh, thanks to transliteration, they can read what uh, people wrote in, in Ajami. And uh, in the schools, there are many uh, departments now uh, teaching all of literature, while in the past they were simply, while uh, teaching the national languages, they were simply teaching the linguistic or the grammar, but right now they're teaching literature too. And uh, with the social networks also, people are commenting uh, and using uh, uh, novels like uh, Domi Golo of Bubakar Boris Job 
or Mbam Akimo or for Sir Aliundo, et cetera. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. And uh, yes, it was a pleasure being with you today. Professor, uh, uh, Professor Ajani, I think, <clears throat> think you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I was saying, uh, I don't think Dr. Kamal uh, was able to join us uh, after all. Oh, is he here still? No. Okay. So I think that is the end of the presentations, uh, if I'm correct. Uh, so we'll leave uh, the ground open for, for questions or uh, for Q&A at uh, this point. So uh, if you have a question, you can just, uh, just indicate and just fire on. Questions or comments? Okay, Dr. Ngom, can you please help us remove your um, your PowerPoint presentation, um, if you don't mind? Yes, that is what I'm trying to do, but uh, oh. I can see. The... Okay, while he's doing that, I have a couple of questions uh, while the rest of us are thinking about uh, our questions. My first question goes to, I think, um, uh, our first presenter about the Hausa novel, uh, online Hausa novels. Okay, I think that is uh, Dr. Maimota. Uh, I was kind of curious about the educational background of these writers, these young writers, these youthful writers who are producing how many thousand, you know, uh, novels already uh, online. So I'm kind of curious about what kind of educational background they come from, really, uh, levels of education and so forth. Is that Dr. Mamuda still with us? I don't think she's here. Oh, okay. Uh, Well, I'll let that go unless it's somebody somebody else uh, has that knowledge or knows that, and they, if somebody can help us with that. If not, my second question goes to our presenters from Eastern Tennessee. Uh, the issue, the perennial issue of what what constitutes African literature. So that's the philosophical thing that. This debate has been going on forever, <laughs> okay? And um, I, I, I don't know what I, what I have is a question or comment, okay? Um, so when we talk about African language, my first question really there is, what really do we define as an African language? Because that is another discussion by itself. What constitutes an African language? Okay, does Nigerian pigeon, for example, constitute an African language? I know there are people who have argued for that because there are there is a generation of young people growing up in Nigeria who speak only only pidgin. Pidgin is their mother tongue now. So there is a group of people now who are growing up on on, on pidgin English. So would pidgin English be considered a Nigerian language it's being spoken by Nigerian kids and and young people growing up? That is the only language they speak. That's the language their mother, their father speaks. You know. So what constitutes an African language? That, that is the first part. Uh, the second part is, so instead of this perennial uh, debate on the language of African language, I, I think in the midst of all of that debate, we tend to forget something that is equally very, very important. Very important is the issue of, I mean, when an author decides to write, the author has an audience in mind. The author has an audience in mind. 
So you don't just write just for writing's sake, but you have a particular audience audience that you want to target. I think we tend to forget about that. So the, the, the discussion that we've heard so far kind of brings that out. Uh, uh, Ngugi, for example, he had this audience that he was targeting. And for the audience he was targeting, that was perfect, what he did. Okay, Achebe, uh, Wale Shoyinka and others have their audience that they were targeting. So I think uh, just uh, continue with the, the longest debate on the language and defining defining African language based on, I mean, sorry, African literature from the perspective of only language. I think we diminish what constitutes African literature because there are many other dimensions that that debate that does not address, okay? It doesn't address audience, it doesn't address educational background. Uh, okay, for example, uh, the issue of, okay, writing in the local, oh, let's say, let's write in an African language. That is another very, very, very complex issue, okay? Because of the uh, educational policies of our leaders in Africa. If you have an educational policy that only teaches the language of the colonialists to kids in school, they never learn their own mother tongue in school. So how does a kid who did not learn his or her own mother tongue in school write in that mother tongue? I mean, so, so, I mean, so there are so many questions. There are so many questions and I, I think that the language thing does not really address, does not capture. It's African language, the definition of African language just only based on the language in which it is written. So these are just my own thought, you know, things I've thought about, you know, so I don't know whether it's a question or it's a comment or whatever, but you know, everybody, everybody can jump in on this one, you know, because I think it's about time that we kind of, you know, probably face that, you know, the fact that it's not a multi, I mean, a, a single, uh, a, a linear kind of thing. I like the comment. Um, and what, uh, what our conclusion is here is that um, we can express our Africanness in various ways. We don't have one limited way of expressing our Africanness. Um, in an earlier conference, I argued that the English, the Englishes we use, I'm sorry, there's a lot of noise in the background. The Englishes we use are not colonial Englishes anymore. That is it. Um, what, what Achebe uses is not British English. There is no um, a Google in British English. No. What he uses is Nigerian English. And um, what Ngugi had used in his other text before writing in Kikuyu was Kenyan English. And we, we really have to get to this point where we admit that, yes, we were colonized. Yes, the British gave us that English, but it is ours now. Oh. We use it as we would want to. And um, so the texts that come out of that, I think it's long overdue. We cannot continue calling them writings in colonial language. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah, for that to respond. Because the response, I mean, the, the question, my question, it's not just uh, just to it's just not just addressing your presentation there, but it's just in general we know because we know this debate has been going on for decades now, for decades, and uh, it still continues to rage. And I have been something I've been thinking about. I've written about it too, but something I've been thinking about. Okay, for example, look at Wally Shinka's writing. For example, when he said, "Okay, like Achebe's in the English that he wrote is not British English." I mean, go to Shane Cass writings and you will see even, even, even much more so that he brings a lot, a lot of things from his Yoruba background, you know, and, 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 from, and from Yoruba religions and so forth that the British person have no, no clue what he's talking about. And then let's not even talk about Emos Tutuola. Let's not even talk about Emos Tutuola, you know. So all this, Emos Tutuola, for example, and that is my, one, of my, uh, one of my major points there. Emos Tutuola had only six years of formal education because of poverty. He lost his dad when he was very young, okay? So, and the only thing he learned was just this little English that he could gather in six years of education. 
and he wrote the first, the fact was the first person to write a full a novel in, 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 in West Africa, you know, in, in English. But what kind of English did he write? You know, did he write in? Teacher last English, can we consider that as British English? Can we consider that as Nigerian English and so forth? So I think the issue is much more complex. It's much more complex than, uh, than, than we've kind of thought about in the past when we kind of just based it on mainly language. So if you are an African, if you are going to write African literature, then it has to be in this language, or it has to be in that language. I think African literature is much bigger than that. It's broader than it's more complex than that. Oh, if I can add something, please. Yes, yes, please. Oh, yes. I, I think that African literature cannot be uh, exclusively written in, in uh, African languages or exclusively written in uh, European languages. For me, uh, African writers and critics are wasting so much time debating on mm -hmm. the issue of language. Yeah. I do believe that a, a literature can be very good literature written in Wolof or any African language, as it could be a very good literature written in European languages. Uh, for instance, uh, I, my best writers, are Ngugi Wathiongo and uh, also uh, Chinua Achebe, okay? I have discovered them uh, through the English language, but everything they write, it's like they're talking to me directly. Yeah. They're using uh, English, but it's like yeah, they're talking to me directly. So that is why I think that the, the notion of the targeted uh, audience is important. When you are writing uh, simply for your community, you can use your uh, community, uh, your mother tongue. Mm -hmm. But when your target or when your audience is larger, broader than that, you can use, for me, uh, languages that can allow you to reach that uh, target. But I do also understand why people are uh, defending uh, the writing of African literature in uh, African languages, it is to me a way of showing that African African languages have potentials to say things that uh, people used to think that they are not able to. You see, but also uh, if you do not use language in a literary form or in a literary way, that language may die one day. Because uh, if you hear very well the keynote speaker this morning, he said that before writing in his uh, mother tongue, he did not suspect that his language was so rich. It was simply when he was writing that he discovered some forms of expressions, words, he did not even think that they existed in his mother tongue. So for me, it's very good to write in your mother tongue, but people writing in uh, European languages, they should not, or they should not be uh, stoned. Okay, as uh, Gugi used to say, that they are writing in uh, Euro-African literature. I love Gugi very well, but I think that yes, they're writing African literature. Yes, Achebe, Emos Tutuala, uh, how to say, Wole Shoyinka, yes, and many others, they write in English and some other in French, but they're writing about the African experience. And that to me is important. Okay, thank you. Very great comments. Uh, I know we don't have time in this section for this, but I think all of this boils down to, so rather than, because the focus has been on the writer, but the biggest blame, as far as I'm concerned, about regarding African languages, either the use or the lack thereof, has goes back to our leaders, politicians, language policy, language policy. That is a big elephant in the room. Okay. Because if you are going to ask people to write in their native languages, then you must teach them the, the native languages. You must teach them. There has to be a policy where the language is important enough that you put resources there. You put resources there. For those of us who are here, most of us growing up, the resources were not placed in our African language. The resources were placed in colonial languages, okay? But of course, I know we can't dwell there. Uh, we've moved 
away from colonial time for a long time now, for decades now. I think it's about time now that these discussions probably go out of just an out of being just an academic discussion and let it go to politicians and our leaders. What are you going to do about it? Do you love our languages enough? We all love our language, we want to speak our languages, but we want to write in our languages. Put the resources there. Put the resources there. So that's my last comment there. Any other questions? If not, I think I will hand over the floor to Dr. Mwazendi. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. I was yeah, going to say, Ikbekele has had his hand up for a while now. Ikbekele. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I just see him now. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I have um, a question for each of the speakers. Um, the first one goes to uh, Dr. Aisha Meimuta. Um, and the question is this, to what extent have the online novels been influenced by precedents outside literary and filmic tra traditions? Because there appears to be a continuum kind of in the cultural expression within the Hausa society. First, there were films, Indian films enjoyed wide acceptance within the Hausa society. Then uh, Hausa, lit, lit, uh, literate Hausa people began to copy the kind of narratives they watch in Indian films. And that resulted in the tradition of Soyaya novels, the Soyaya pamphlet, that's love pamphlets. And then from love pamphlet, when the video technology came in, we have the Hausa video film industry. So there's this continuum. So how does uh, these online Hausa novels continue that tradition, that continuum, and how much of the precedent narratives are in the uh, online Hausa novels? So that's to Dr. Aisha Meimuta. And uh, for um, um, the second presenters, I, I read Ngugi's Devil on the Cross 14 years ago, and uh, it still remains very memorable. I like the novel very much. I still vividly remember the character of uh, Mwara and his uh, contraption, his, his uh, car. Mwara's Matatu, Matata, Matamu, Modoti, Ford. I remember it uh, almost every time I remember Ngugi Wationgu. Um, and it, my comment is that <clears throat> Things fall apart, although written in English, uh, has taught me more about Igbo culture than uh, Ngugi Wationgo's novel. Although written originally in Gikuyu, uh, Things Fall Apart, written in English, has taught me, taught me more about Igbo culture than Ngugi's novel taught me about the Kuyu culture. So the question of uh, what African language, whether African language should be used to portray African experiences and culture or European language or, you know, colonialist languages should be, or, sorry, uh, European languages should be used. I think um, where Ngugi Watiung, uh, sorry, uh, Chinua Achebe really did a very great job. And I, I think any language one uses, uh, the, the best thing is to, uh, uh, do it well because actually they really did it well and uh, the, he really presented the African culture in a way we can, uh, in a way that is very exciting and engaging. And uh, this, the third comment, co uh, this is a question now. The third one is, a, is also a question like the first one. The second, second one I think is just a comment. The third one is a question. Uh, do pre-Islamic that goes to Dr. Usman Ngom. Do pre-Islamic history and heroes find outlet in literature written in Ajami? Uh, like we read of uh, uh, heroes like uh, Sundiata, Keita, Salif. Uh, did they, have there been Ajami, not maybe uh, writings that featured such, uh, that featured such questions. 
Okay, all right, Dr. Angam, you can go ahead. You can go ahead. Oh, yes, thank you very much for this question. But I don't think that there are some uh, Ajami poetry featuring uh, pre Islamic heroes for the simple reason that this Ajami uh, literature was uh, fighting against a system because there were two systems that were uh, in the country. It was uh, uh, what we call the, the Chado. The Chado are the pagan. And uh, there are people who uh, uh, like war, drinking, you know, and uh, sometimes taking uh, other people's property. Okay. And uh, the other, uh, system were the system of the uh, of the uh, of, of colonialism. So, in the uh, Ajami literature, you will see that those people are shown as a villain, meaning people you should not copy. Okay? Uh, many of the uh, uh, Ajami literature, the one with uh, uh, Musaka or Bayjahate. Uh, they say that those people, like the Chedo, the way of living is very different from the way of living a Muslim should choose. So what they said, or what they did was to show you, as I said, the prophet and the founders of the religious brotherhood, those were shown as heroes to, to follow. And the other people, like the, the colonizer, or the Chedo community, uh, they were uh, very satirical toward them, saying that these are people you should not uh, follow because this life is very short and that in the year after, you will not uh, be rewarded if you uh, choose this uh, kind of way of life, but you should uh, keep on the uh, Islamic teaching in order to be rewarded in the year after. So no, they are not uh, yes, the people uh, in the pre-Islamic uh, uh, tradition who are uh, valorized by this kind of literature. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Is that clear? Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Maimota. OK, looks like um, Dr. Maimota. Yes, sir. All right. Did, what, uh, did you hear the question that uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Salahu asked? Yes, sir. Sir? Oh, I was asking whether you heard the questions uh, that Mr. Salahu uh, asked, asked you. If you didn't hear, he can probably re repeat it quickly. He uh, asked let him repeat, questions. please. OK. Uh, Mr. Yes, Salahu, can you quickly? Okay, the question is that there is a kind of continuum when it comes to the cultural expression within the Hausa society. Uh, there was Indian, there were Indian, the acceptance of Indian films within the Hausa society, and that inspired the Suyaya novel tradition. That's the love pamphlet tradition. Then from there, you have Carnywood, that is the Hausa film industry when you know, not the uh, video film technology became available, they started you know, shooting films, the kind of love stories you, that have been transferred from the Indian film then to the love pamphlet, then was transferred to the Nollywood, uh, sorry, the uh, Hausa video film industry on screen. It, it was transferred to the screen. Now, this is a new tradition, the online, um, Hausa novel. Looks like, okay. It well, looks like uh, his mic is having some issues. Uh, Dr. Ramoda, do you think, think you can respond? By them? We have just about uh, five minutes for, for this panel. Dr. Mamota? Okay. 
Um, uh, I'm with you, sir. You know, Richard abused uh, the people back. So, culture, what has the reason there is no way we can run away from borrowing. But as this research, realize that those online writers portray in their, in their writings. For example, I have mentioned one called Hangenda. That novel portrays how typical house house uh, in a polygamous family. So also the the women halal of uh, it it looks at the what especially in society that is the issue of the victims and suffers from abuse from the society. So sometimes uh, Indian films and other issues to say that I think is a problem by people Yeah, I think Dr. Mamuda is also. I think this is one of the down, one of the downsides of technology. Sometimes, <laughs> as much as we we you know. Uh, Zoom has been very helpful in the in these uh, difficult days. Yeah, but sometimes we have those uh, issues, bandwidth issues. Yep. So, uh, Mr. Salau, did you were you able to capture some of the responses, though? Yes. <laughs> uh, <Okay>. Hardly. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think uh, maybe we'll con we'll continue that next year, I guess. <laughs> next <laughs> next self, <laughs> we'll continue. We'll, go, we'll come back. We'll come back and continue with you know responding to those uh, questions. But I think uh, our time is basically up. Thank you everybody uh, for your attention, for paying close attention to this, and for your patience. You know, um, and thanks to our distinguished uh, presenters, our panelists, for doing such an excellent job. Thank you, everyone. So. Uh,